good evening and welcome to the, the Stow Market Online service. It was a great joy uh, to lead this morning. Uh, if you weren't there for that, my name is Daniel. I'm the assistant pastor at a church in Nottingham. Uh, and this morning we spent some time in Ephesians. And uh, this evening we're going to spend some time in the book of Psalms. Uh, and I want us to begin by hearing uh, God's word in Revelation chapter 22. We'll begin by hearing from the very word of God. So Revelation chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign for ever and ever. Well, having heard from God, let's uh, respond in prayer together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the everlasting God, the God who promises life and peace. We give you thanks for where history is heading. As we read Revelation 22, we're reminded of eternity in your presence. The place where we'll be at eternal rest with you. A place with no more death or pain, no more hatred or war, no more evil, no more cancer, no more tears. No more fear. Revelation 22 is a great comfort to us. And we see here that you'll do away with all evil and suffering. You are a just God and we praise you for your just judgments. That you will uh, one day destroy evil is good news. You won't sweep it under the rug. You won't ignore it. Uh, you, Father, will judge all wickedness and unrighteousness. And we praise you for sparing us on that great day. We know that we deserve judgment because of our sin. We've robbed you of glory and desired to take it for ourselves. And yet we know that Christ stepped in and took the judgment that our sin deserves. Christ died in our stead that we might have life. And for this we give you our praise and we do so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, well, we've just read of our glorious future in the very presence of God. Uh, and now we're uh, going to sing about that gospel hope now. Uh, so join with me as we sing when this passing world is done.
Bible at hand, please turn uh, to Psalm 46. This is where we're going to be this evening. Uh, Psalm 46. I'll uh, let you just find that quickly. Psalm 46, beginning in verse 1. Uh, it's to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Elamotha song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he's brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's come to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we confess that this world can be scary. It can feel like the earth is giving way. Uh, there are many toils and snares uh, in the Christian life. We face indwelling sin, uh, the weakness of our flesh, uh, often weighs us down and turns our eyes away from you. Uh, we face the devil. He, he's our great enemy and seeks to devour us with his flaming darts. We face the world with all of its idols and luxuries, which pull our hearts away from eternal realities and into the kingdom and the and the. Uh, uh, the things of this age. Father, there are so many things that can cause fear. And yet your word says you are our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. We do not need to fear because of your sustaining grace. You are with us by your Holy Spirit. We are not left to fight the enemy alone. It is Christ who gives us the victory. He is the one exalted in the nations. The one exalted in the earth. He is the great King of kings and Lord of lords, and with him we need not fear. With him we're not in danger of being on the losing side. We give you thanks for sending the Lord Jesus, and for sending your Spirit to be with us now. And help us to be those who live by faith, faith in your promises, the promises of your word. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, having uh, heard God's word, we're now going to sing a sovereign protector I have.
please uh, turn uh, back in your Bibles to Psalm 46. Uh, we're going to hear from God's Word now, but um, before we do, uh, let's pray and ask for the Lord's help one last time. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful, loving Father, we come before you and ask that you would speak to us now uh, in your Word. We pray that we would see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory, uh, that we would be shaped by your words, comforted, convicted, encouraged, uh, Lord, may our minds, uh, may we grow in our knowledge, uh, may we grow in our affections and in our obedience as we come to now to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know how you felt about uh, 2020, uh, but for me, it has felt uh, turbulent. It's felt like the earth is giving way. Uh, who would have thought that one virus could shut down the whole world? Who would have thought? Uh, who could have imagined that churches would shut down entirely? Who could have guessed that sports stadiums would be shut down and the economy crash? And really, that's only just the, uh, the beginning, isn't it? Uh, thousands of people are dead and many of us are living in fear. But 2020 gets even worse, doesn't it? We've witnessed all of the political division and hatred that's gone on, not just in America, but in our own country as well. Hate and all kinds of human ugliness. On top of that, you turn on Christian news and you hear how uh, uh, Fulani tribesmen have mowed down our brothers and sisters who are, who are simply gathering just to meet with God that day. You hear of persecution in China, pastors, be, pastors being arrested and sent off into training camps, probably never to be seen again. We see abortion laws become less and less restricted. We're seeing refugees fleeing their countries, 50 million refugees. And then there's the explosion that went off in Lebanon, killing innocents, on and on it goes. It feels like the earth is giving way, doesn't it? Uh, for some of us, 2020 may have been extra painful. Bad news at the doctors or the losing of loved ones. Painful conversations with family members. Debilitating depression. Uh, the abiding pain of not being able to do the things you once uh, were able to do. It really feels like the world's falling apart. And if we're honest, just for a moment, it just sucks. Some days you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, life is turbulent. Well, if that's how you feel this evening, well then Psalm 46 speaks directly into that space. Uh, it gives us a steady confidence. Uh, Psalm 46 promises us peace in place of panic. A faith in place of fear. A confidence in place of terror and joy uh, in place of sorrow. Uh, the, when, when the world's falling apart, we need to remember that God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Psalm 46 is one of the greatest hits of the Psalms. It's top of the charts for, for many of the saints. Uh, God's people have turned there and anchored their, their stormy lives uh, in its words. Uh, we're told it was written by the sons of Korah. That's a group of uh, talented musicians. And they were inspired to write songs for God's people. Uh, and they have written, written one of the best songs of all time, let's be honest. We don't know when Psalm 46 was written, uh, but it was written in a world of uncertainty. Uh, Israel experienced many stormy days. 2020 was kind of like life as normal for them. Uh, and so Israel would sing Psalm 46 to strengthen their weak knees and weary hearts. And it's a psalm that's relevant to us as well, because let's be honest, it's difficult to be a Christian. Life is tough, isn't it? Uh, the world is a dangerous place. And so Psalm 46 will help us to live the Christian life of faith, no matter the circumstance. And Psalm 46 will help us to live the Christian life of faith, no matter the circumstance. And it will do that by having us long for the things to come. 
It will have us yearning for the future. Uh, the Psalms have this knack for, for really for pulling on the human heartstrings. Uh, they want to get stuck into our hearts and pull on our emotions. Uh, Athanasius once said, I feel the full range of human emotions of life here in the Psalms. And Psalm 46 has this longing for what's to come. Uh, so let's together bring our fearful and weary hearts to God's word and see what it says. The opening verses provide us with bad news and good news. It's the introduction to the psalm. Uh, have a look at the bad news. In verses 2 and 3, it appears that the world is falling apart. Do you feel the intensity of the psalm? He's mustering up all the poetic language he can. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains move into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. I mean, we picture raging hurricanes and destructive earthquakes. He could be describing Nepal or any tragedy in recent, of, uh, recent times. Remember the devastating tsunami tr uh, triggered in recent events. Uh, we have the saying, don't we, the force of nature. If you've ever been caught out at sea in a rip, you'll know what I mean. You felt the power and the rage of the ocean. And it's terrifying. You don't have the strength to resist it. But that's nothing compared to what we have here. Uh, the ocean in verse 2 is wrecking mountains. Mountains are engulfed into the heart of the sea. Uh, this is all picture, poetic language of chaos and evil. Look at verse 6. The nations are raging, so the kingdoms of the world have something to do with it. Uh, verse 8. God seems to be behind it. He's the one bringing desolation to the earth. That's a bit confusing. But this is a serious problem, isn't it? If you call Earth your home, if your address is planet Earth, this is a problem. The world is falling apart. The nations are raging against God. Our fallen, broken world is imploding. You only need to turn on the news to see that, don't you? The world's a scary place to live. I, I wonder if you felt that recently. Uh, we face the problem of a hostile, dangerous and sinful world. That's our home. And let's be honest, that's quite scary. And yet, look at verse 1. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains are moved, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. That's good news. We're not alone. God is our refuge. God is our refuge. And my wife and I spent some time in Glastonbury a few months back. And uh, if you've ever been to Glastonbury, uh, you'll know that there's this uh, small chapel at the top of this Big Hill, a Glastonbury tour, uh, they call it, don't they? And so one morning, uh, Brooke and I, uh, we set off for this chapel, and uh, halfway up, it started getting terribly windy. And I, I mean, like, people holding onto the floor kind of wind. Old ladies getting knocked over. It was really bad. It was, it was pretty crazy. And eventually, uh, I made it up. It was a hard slog uh, against the wind. And at the top, there's this beautiful chapel. Uh, and the people were rushing in to it uh, because it was a refuge from the storm it was a protective barrier from the wind uh, if you wanted to get out of the storm you needed to get in quick uh, you were safe inside and that is kind of the picture here that's what god is for us god is our refuge a shelter in the storm and he's ever present the psalm says and he's not like us we aren't always there for people, are we? we uh, we're often too busy, but God is never too busy for us. He's always available. He's a very present help in time of trouble. And so the psalmist is saying, look, you don't need to be afraid. Uh, even if you, uh, in the face of trouble itself, no matter what you're going through right now, God is with you. And that places our hearts of fear. Uh, doesn't it, with hearts of faith. 
Because of who God is, the psalmist says in verse 2, we will not fear. Charles Spurgeon once said, The words I am with you are enough for my soul to live upon, no matter who forsakes me here. The words I am with you are enough for my soul to live upon, no matter who forsakes me here. God is our refuge and strength. So these opening verses are the introduction to the the whole psalm. Uh, The world gives us reason to fear, but God gives us reason to hope. And so if you're a note taker, uh, the psalm is split up into three parts. We've just looked at the first, that's the introduction. Verses 1 to 3 really summarise the psalm. And it's it's something like this if you take notes. Uh, In the midst of a chaotic world, God is our refuge and strength. In the midst of a chaotic world... God is our refuge, and God is our strength. And then the psalm fleshes out for us in our uh, that out for us in the next two points. So we see God our refuge in verses four to seven. That's our first point. Very simple. God our refuge, and then we see God our strength in verses eight to eleven. That's our second point. Again, really simple. God our refuge. Point number one, and then God our strength. Point number two, that's really the structure of this marvellous psalm. <clears throat> so let's uh, begin with the first point and uh, rest our souls on what we find. God is our refuge. I wonder if you remember back to when COVID first broke out at the beginning of the year. Do you remember? It feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Uh, the world was in a state of panic. Everyone was uh, buying up all the toilet paper and the uh, emptying the medicine shelves, and we were all afraid that we'd run out on the essentials that we need to survive. Uh, some of us even stocked up on canned foods. We were kind of crippled by fear. And it was really the unknown, wasn't it? Do you remember? I wonder if you remember that feeling. Because that's kind of how the psalmist is feeling. And so I want us to remember that to get a sense of how Israel must have felt as they sung this psalm. Uh, They experienced a turbulent fear. How will we go on when everything around us is falling apart? How will we go on when everything around us is falling apart? That's the headspace we're in. And so with that in mind, just look at what we find in verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Verse 4 sounds like another world, doesn't it? It's almost like the psalmist is daydreaming. He's imagining an otherworldly city. The earth's unstable and crumbling, it's falling apart, yet there's a place where God dwells. A place that cannot be shaken, a a perfect refuge, it's a fortress with endless life-giving water. Did you notice it's a place of joy, there's happiness here. Uh, The world poses no threat to this city, this is a place of refuge. That's the place where I want to be, are you like me? (laughs) Tired of the shaky world that we live in? Everyone feels that, don't they? That you long for safety and security? Then church, feast your eyes on the unflinching confidence of Psalm 46. There's a place of refuge, a place of security. There's water here that isn't like the water of verse 3. With God, the water is no longer menacing seas, but a life-giving river. A river of gladness because God dwells there. We're being shown around the city of God and here there's joy and refuge. In Old Testament terms, uh, the city of God is Jerusalem. uh, The place where God met with his people. And and just notice verse 5. The psalmist says it can't be shaken because God's there. She will not be moved, it says. But of course, 
Jerusalem was shaken many times. It was sacked by Babylon. It was sacked by the Romans and many other nations. So what's going on? How can the city of God be a place of refuge when history shows it isn't? How can the city of God be a place of refuge when history shows it isn't? Well, that's because the city of God isn't ultimately Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was a, a shadow pointing back to Eden and forward to the new Jerusalem. Uh, and so Psalm 46 kind of lands us back in the Garden of Eden, the, the garden full of life-giving rivers, the place where God dwells with humanity, a place of peace and abundance. Uh, but it also looks forward to the new creation, doesn't it? The, the new Jerusalem, which is why I read uh, Revelation 22 earlier. Uh, the river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God. The river for the healing of the nations. There's no more pain or suffering there. Did you notice there's no pandemic, no death, no warring nations, no reason to fear. God's there as a refuge. That's what's in store for us if we're trusting in Jesus. If you're a Christian this evening, the psalmist really wants to pull on your affections. We said earlier, uh, he's trying to make you long for the future, to long for what's to come. You have a future without clouds, dear brother and sister. No more rainy days, no more bad news from doctors or by post. There's no one to hurt you here. The pain will one day be over. The glory is awaiting you. That's what's in store for all of us who are trusting in Jesus. Are you feeling the truth of this psalm? You know, I'm not just asking us to just know it, but do we feel it? Do you feel the comfort of Psalm 46? Life is tough, the world's turbulent, but God is my refuge in the storm. And one day I'll experience the fullness of that promise. If you don't feel that, if you're sitting there thinking, look, I know I should feel it. I know it to be true, but it hasn't really affected me. Well, then can I ask you to commit through uh, to, to praying through this psalm this week? Pray through Psalm 46 this week. Let, let God's word take that root into your heart and give you the richness. Let it impact your life because this ain't just for the future. The promise is changes the way we live now it transforms our our fear into faith we can walk with confidence we can face our trials with certainty that the world doesn't need to strangle our joy it it doesn't need to take away our peace does it the world doesn't need to take away our peace we can't deny that the world's hostile we can't deny that life is painful, but we can face pain with certainty. Because we don't just have Psalm 46 or Genesis 2, the Garden of Eden. We, we can flick forward to Revelation 22. We know where we're heading. Our Saviour will one day overcome every groan and every tremor. Our Saviour will one day come and restore all things. Jesus will defeat chaos once and for all. And the gospel only confirms the promise, doesn't it? Just look at the cross. Didn't it look like chaos had won? Or didn't it look like chaos was victorious? For three days chaos celebrated. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. But bursting forth in glorious day... Up from the grave he rose again. Christ conquered the chaotic powers of evil. He put them to open shame. The, the promise of God being a refuge in the storm. This isn't wishful thinking. The cross has assured our safety in God's presence. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ has assured our safety in God's presence. And God's with us now. 
This isn't just future. God's with us. Now he's given us his spirit as a down payment. We considered that this morning in Ephesians 1. Uh, The most high God dwells in you and me by his spirit. Uh, God helps us not just when morning dawns, verse 5, but all day, every day. Christ as well intercedes for us in heaven. Doesn't that bring you confidence? Jesus intercedes for us every moment of every day. We're not in danger of falling out of his hands. Not when Christ is interceding for us. We're not in danger of falling out of God's hands. Not when Jesus is our intercessor. As a church, you have nothing to fear. God is our refuge. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the sea, though the oceans roar, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. The mountains were moved in verse 2, weren't they? But God's city is not. God's home is a place of refuge. And if you're a Christian, God's home is your home too. Well, then the uh, the psalm introduces us to the nations of the world. Have a look at verse 6. The nations rage, uh, the kingdoms totter. Uh, The nations are a part of the problem, aren't they? Uh, Back in Psalm 2, the nations rebel against the Lord and against his king. Uh, And here we see the same thing. The nations of the earth rage against God. Uh, Whether that's Babylon or Caesar or the Ottomans or... Napoleon or whoever, any nation that rejects God is a nation that rages. England, our own country, it's a nation uh, that wars against God. But notice, God only needs to speak, doesn't he? Look at verse 6. He utters his voice, the earth melts. That's who's on our side. The the God who, who speaks and planets melt like butter. The kingdoms of the world don't stand a chance, do they? Uh, They might make us tremble. They might uh, melt our hearts, but they can't melt the earth, can they? But God can. He utters his voice and the earth melts. We'll think a little bit more about what God's doing uh, in a moment. But the good news is he's with us. He's on our side. In this chaotic world of raging nations... God himself is our refuge. Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. No matter how bad things get, the God of Jacob is our fortress. The God who was with Jacob. Remember him? Remember Jacob? He had a stormy life, didn't he? He had many reasons to fear And yet God was with him all the way. And it was undeserved grace, wasn't it? Uh, Jacob wasn't a great guy. (laughs) God was with him because of grace. And he's with us because of grace too. God is our refuge. That's our first point. Uh, But he's also our strength, which is our, our final point. God is our strength. I wonder if you've ever asked the question, why is the world the way it is? Have you ever asked that question, why is everything so bad? If God created this place, why is it in such a mess? Maybe that's a question that you have. Uh, Well, the psalmist tells us why in verse 8. Have a look at verse 8. The psalmist says, Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. So what's he saying? Well, it's quite surprising. Our world is a world under judgment. Uh, That's why it's so turbulent. That's why it shakes and roars and foams. God is judging our world. And uh, that's what verse 8 is saying. The desolations in the world are from the hands of God. Uh, But he's not doing it for the fun of it. It's not like God gets a kick out of desolating the earth. 
Uh, he's judging the earth because of rebellious humanity. Uh, the nations that we saw in verse 6, remember them. Uh, the people uh, raging against God and one another. Well, God is bringing judgment upon them. For those of us in Christ, we're safe from that, aren't we? Uh, if you've trusted in Jesus this evening, God's judgment will pass you by. As I was safe in Glastonbury Tor, so we are safe in Christ. You, you don't need to be afraid of judgments. You'll be disciplined for your sin. That will happen because every loving father disciplines uh, their children. But you won't ever be punished for your sin. We believe that Jesus was punished in our stead. That's why we're all about the gospel, isn't it? That's why we sing the gospel and pray the gospel and talk the gospel and read the gospel and preach the gospel. The gospel is what we're all about. It's such good news. Rather than facing the warrior God of verses 8 to 11, we have him on our sides. But this promise is only for those who've trusted in Jesus, isn't it? Those who won't trust in Jesus will face... The warrior God of Psalm 46. And that will be a fearsome day. But if you're a Christian, uh, be assured that God fights for you. God is a warrior who, who fights for his church. That's what we see in uh, these verses. And it's good news. Uh, if God's resolved to go into battle for you, you'll never lose. Don't we see that at the cross? Uh, Jesus conquering the devil. He was victorious over the enemy. God really is our strength. And there's something final and conclusive about these verses, isn't there? Look at verse 9. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. That's universal, isn't it? God will make wars cease. He will bring peace on earth. Isn't that what we all long for? World peace. You know, look around you. Listen to the music on the radio. Read the bestsellers. The world desperately longs for peace. And here we see a promise. The world peace is coming. But guess what? It won't come through Bill Gates or Muhammad or the Green Party. Uh, world peace will come only through God. And it will come in His timing, not ours. And what a day that will be. What a day that will be. A day when child trafficking will be a thing of the past. When nations will lay down their weapons for good. When abortions will cease. When murder and crime will be done away with. God will one day bring world peace. It's such good news. Psalm 46 has us deeply thirsting for things to come, doesn't it? We all want world peace. We all know it. We all cry out for it. And it will be a reality. The groans of the world will one day be over. But here's the bad news. Uh, the day we see world peace will be the day we see verse 8 and the rest of verse 9. World peace will come when God brings desolation on the world. Uh, world peace will come when God shatters the spear and breaks the bow. Uh, world peace will come when the warrior God breaks the rebels of verse 6. It says that even char chariots, uh, which were the tanks of the ancient world, even they will be burnt with fire. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Uh, we all want peace, we all like the idea of peace, but we don't really like the idea of judgment, do we? But you see that they'll, they'll both come together. Uh, the day when God brings peace is the day when he destroys those who prevent it. It was always going to be this way. Uh, we like the idea of uh, the God of love, don't we? But God the warrior, uh, you don't see that one hung up on our, our walls, do you? And so brothers and sisters, know this. 
God is one day going to do something about the Fulani tribesmen slaughtering our brothers and sisters in Christ. God's going to do something about that. God's one day going to do something about persecution in China. Xi Jinping thinks he's gotten away with it. He won't get away with it then. And it'll be final and it'll be complete. Uh, God's going to deal with the evil that goes on in our own nation. Guys, this is good news. But it takes God to step in and fight for his people. Salvation comes through judgment. Just as it did with Noah, just as we see at the cross, victory will come when God's enemies are destroyed. Our warrior God fights for us. And one day he'll bring us peace. And I mean real peace. Uh, Not sort of like the hippie peace sign that you see on bumper uh, sticker cars. Peace. Not that peace. I mean real abiding peace. The, The kind of peace we see in Revelation. Where we're told there'll be no more sea. In other words, no more chaos. No more evil to threaten us. Uh, where we're told that the gate of the city will remain open. In other words, it doesn't need to be shut to keep out enemies. Persecution will be a thing of the past. God will do away with evil for good. The psalmist is saying, come and look at what the Lord does. Our warrior God is a God who brings peace by destroying enemies. He is sovereign and he says, have a look to chaos, verse 10 Be still, be still, and know that I am God. What a comfort that is. The power of chaos will bow the knee to King Jesus. In fact, we see it in the Gospels, don't we? At the chaotic waters overwhelm the disciples. They wake Jesus up, and what does he do? Be still. And the waters and the winds cease. So verse 10 isn't talking about sort of sitting under a tree, uh, closing your eyes and going off into a trance. Uh, I know, uh, be still, and know that I'm God, uh, pops up on Facebook from time to time. I think I've probably been guilty of that too. But it's not really a nice sentimental quote for birthday cards. Instead, it's God the warrior saying, be still, I'm the exalted one. I'm the one who shatters the spear and breaks the bow. Be humbled. You're not God. I am. It's very different to how a lot of, a lot of us uh, quote uh, verse 10, isn't it? Be still and know that I'm God. It should leave us humbled before the holy God of Scripture. Not feeling sort of tingly and, and sentimental. And then we see something spectacular in the rest of verse 10. Uh, The threat of the nations that we saw in verse 6 is reversed. Have a look. God says, I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Uh, So friends, the day's coming when God will be exalted high in all the earth. The nations that raged against him uh, will come under his rule. God's grace is staggering, isn't it? The marvel of the gospel is that God saves those who hate him. The marvel of the gospel is that God saves those who hate him. Paul said that in Romans 5, didn't he? Uh, While you were enemies, Christ died for you. God will bring terms of peace to the nations and they will surrender peace through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow the knee to King Jesus and confess he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is our God. Uh, This is our sovereign God who fights for us. God is our strength. And that's encouraging, isn't it? That our evangelism isn't fruitless. Our efforts to reach the lost aren't in vain. Even if people taunt us and mock us. Even if we feel like laughingstocks. 
The world's always persecuted the church. It's always done that. But the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Through persecution, the gospel plants churches. Thousands are birthed into the kingdom because our God is with us. God strengthens us for this work because he's invested in being exalted in all the nations. We don't need to fear persecution. Uh, we don't need to fear the assaults of Satan. We don't need to fear the taunts when we share the gospel. Verse 11 shows us why. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is with us. That's what we've been seeing all along, haven't we? Uh, Alec Matia once said that Psalm 46 is a Christmas psalm. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the heart of the psalm, God with us. In all the hardship of life. And he'll bring us into that heavenly city uh, that we get a taste for in Psalm 46. A city that can never be shaken. And he's our strength to assure that we get there. And so I hope you felt the confidence of Psalm 46. It's an unflinching confidence, isn't it? It reminds us that our God is with us. Things are tough. Life is hard. Your own experiences will testify to that. Sometimes it feels like the earth is giving way. But God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I want us to finish with a, a poem by Martin Luther. Of course, his a famous hymn, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is uh, based off Psalm 46. Uh, but he wrote a poem based on the Psalm 2. And with this we'll close. It goes like this. God is our refuge in distress. Our shield of hope through every care. Our shepherd watching us to bless. And therefore we will not despair. Though the mountains shake and hills their place forsake and billows over them break. Yet still will we not fear. For thou, O God, art ever near. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we uh, realise how scary uh, this world can be. A fallen, broken world, a dying world, a world full of sin and hatred towards your people and your gospel. Uh, it can be overwhelming at times, especially as we see the, the fallenness of the, the, the wickedness of humanity that we've been seeing this year and also of the curse itself of uh, the coronavirus and other things, Lord. It can throw us into a state of panic, and yet uh, we're reminded that you are our refuge and strength. You are present with us. You are the God who is near. You are the God who has reminded us of that heavenly city in Revelation 22, pointed at from Psalm 46, that river which streams make glad the city of God that place that cannot be shaken. But would you uplift our hearts, comfort our hearts, replace our fear with faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond to God's word uh, in song, and we're going to finish with a mighty fortress uh, is our God. Fortress is our God.